Um, thanks, Bill Ann, for that generous introduction. And um, I'm really proud to be part of the Global Cultures. I'm really part, uh, proud to be part of the Global Cultures project as well. And, um, and it's really great to be gathered here with all of um, my colleagues from Canada and beyond um, <laughs> in Vigo, which has become an important global site for the re-articulation of, of Canadian literature, I think. It's become a, a node in the uh, circulation of knowledge and the transformation of knowledge um, in Canada, as both Canada and Spain go through dramatic transformations as they enter into an imagined competitive global economy, the way that these things are being refigured. So what I'd like to do is um, do a kind of lateral lecture on changes on the waterfront, the way that the waterfront has been reimagined in some senses since the 1960s, as you see in this image, um, to today. And so I, I want to do this by looking at some literary representations and, and, um, and projects from visual arts. So to give a little bit more of a cultural engagement with the kind of economic discourses that we've been asked to live our lives through. Um, my title is simply On and Off the Waterfront, which refers to the movie, but also to the Miles Davis album On, on and Off the Corner. Uh, in a recent text on urbanism and art, the American artist Martha Rosler comments that recent large-scale developments mark a further step in the long transformation of urban waterfronts, formerly the filthy and perilous haunts of the poor, often transient and foreign-born workers servicing the ports into recreational zones, beckoning the most, mostly young and decidedly upper middle class. The water's edge, which was once figured as the dangerous divide between this world and underworld, between safety and the unknown, now promises pleasurable adventures in travel and beach going. So Rosler's dramatic narrative of the class makeover of waterfronts only tells part of the story of the transformation of cities in the last 35 years or so. Yet it does point to the ways that the waterfront has moved from, a lo from localized sites of production and global transportation to new zones of leisure and consumption within an urban fabric textured more and more by the rights of ownership and the dreams of the engine of real estate than by notions of civic democracy or even dreams of urban diversity. As Kim Dovey points out in a study of Melbourne, waterfront transformations offer possibilities for urban innovation, new visions of the city in the form of urban design, public art, and architecture that reconstructs the cognitive map of the city. However, there is simultaneously the potential for significant damage to the city, erosion of local diversity, commodification of place identity, the erosion of public space through privatization, and its tranquilization through new forms of exclusion and purification. So to expand on the story of waterfronts and their globalized and localized roles, I want to turn to literary and artistic engagements with these sites. And I'll attempt to do this within a framework that catches the shifts in cities that have brought us to this moment. Cities today are tied into an economic system that often pits place against place in, com in competition for elusive global capital. Urban geographers call this phenomena the competitive city model, and it's laced into neoliberal forms of urban governance and two shifts, I think, in the global economy which have turned attention to cities in new ways. The first shift identified by Neil Smith as an economic development in which, quote, most crucially, real estate development becomes the centerpiece of a city's productive economy, an end to itself, justified by appeals to jobs, taxes, and tourism, in ways that could hardly have been envisioned in the 1960s when gentrification emerged as a process. The, con the construction of new gentrification complexes in central cities across the world has become an increasingly unsaleable capital accumulation strategy for competing urban economies. So even through the kind of denseness of that language, you get a sense of the, the, um, the way that the economic has, has altered the texture of cities and everyday life. So as a result, gentrification is now, a, is now common globally, taking particular shapes, of course, and textures in cities, and shifting from a neighborhood effect to larger scale transformation. 
Secondly, leading up to the economic crisis extended from over 2007 and 2008 and continuing today to a lesser degree, David Harvey argues that um, a cyclical accumulation crisis led to real estate to become a fixed site for the parking of, of global capital, for, for the accumulation crisis of excess capital. This abstract process alters cities in many material ways. So in my experience living in Vancouver on the edge of Stanley Park, I look out from the window of our rented one bedroom apartment to a 24 story building that has three apartments in use, while the others essentially function as long term speculative yet reasonably safe banks, or as Peter Yeager and I were joking about it, it's more like they're electronic deposit zones in some sense. Um, I'm sure in Spain there's similar examples, particularly in globalized cities where, where um, this elusive capital is, is parking itself. So to expand on this story and to give it a cultural view, I want to move through the idea of the waterfront and the shore as a contact zone in a colonial and cultural manner and move through the debate to the political, which has recently sprung from the work of Carl Schmitt and the way that Chantal Mouffe has re rejigged that amongst others, to question whether urban waterfronts are now imagined as an important aspect of the post-political city. Rather than being a contact zone where cultural and political conflicts intersect, or as a dangerous and alluring liminal space that formed a seam in the city, as Rossler describes, and an urban frontier, waterfronts are now designed as conflict-free zones, or imagined as conflict-free zones, that are understood to be the outcome of shifts in the global economy and the desires of urban dwellers. So that relationship between consumption side and production side um, alterations within the city. My shift to passive language here mirrors the passiveness of much of the language of recent urban developments. Consider, for example, the lack of historical actors in this description from an important anthology on waterfronts and post-industrial cities um, so just to give you a sense of the language, waterfronts speak to a past based in industrial production. So please don't look out the window and see any industrial production because otherwise it throws this narrative off. Um, to a time when tremendous growth and expansion, to social and economic structures that no longer exist, to a time when environmental degradation was an unacknowledged byproduct of growth and profit. Through historical circumstances, these sites are immediately adjacent to the centers of older cities and typically are separated from the physical, cultural, and psychological connections that exist in every city. They speak to a future, to providing opportunities for cities to reconnect with their water's edge. Typically, these areas exist as spaces of urban redundancy, as leftover spaces in the city. It's from waterfronts in post-industrial cities edited by Richard Marshall. Well, the underlying spatial ideology uh, here is that waterfronts have changed through historical circumstances as opposed to historical actors to become moribund spaces disconnected from the city itself, despite their proximity to the heart of the city. Therefore, new urban planning must reconnect waterfronts to the city and its citizens. Such language is only possible through a particular class lens that sees production and, area, production and areas defined by labor and its sociability as unnecessary and static practices, even antiquated in the life of the city. To view these areas as disconnected spatially and culturally isolates the world of work on the waterfront, while on the other hand, it tends to universalize spaces of leisure and consumption as connected to the city and accessible to all. This view has itself become troubled by new security concerns emanating largely from the USA but adopted in Canadian ports that have isolated port areas from the rest of the city. As a result, as Deb Cohen and Susanna Bunce argue, post 9-11 security concern, post 9-11 port security initiatives are sometimes at odds and at other times at ease with the competitive city agendas that are readily apparent in waterfront cities. Approached in this manner, waterfronts are crucial in several ways, as zones that define cities within the global urban nexus, as well as areas of use and pleasure that are central to the right to the city, 
and as contested zones of spatial justice where access and spatial democracy hit the structures of ownership and designed leisure. What I've sidestepped so far is the, affect, is the actively affective aspect of waterfronts. Whatever imagination of the waterfront that is foregrounded, beautiful or, and natural or derelict and industrial, they are never neutral. Living in a waterfront city and having worked at the water's edge, I worry about the tranquilization, to use Dovey's term, of the waterfront. In Vancouver, which I'll largely focus on, the shift in urban planning in the late 1970s towards city design based on lifestyle has led us to a further split between labor and leisure, with the devaluing of labor and the commoditization of leisure, despite all of, all of its pleasures. And I'd also emphasize the pleasure, pleasure of labor. Um, and this has closed down some of the wilder aspects of harbors and ports. Now, the time um, leading up to mega events or major transformative moments within the life of um, urban territories, and they always um, produce long and deep, long and deep um, effects. So leading up to the 2012 Winter Olympics, Vancouver began to implement new moorage, moorage restrictions along the city's waterfront. Tying together ecological concerns to new regime of laws, the city's blue ways regulations actually sought to make the boating community of approximately 100 boats that did not rent moorage from marinas more short-term and transient. The boats that were using the waterways as a commons ranged from sailboats, transformed former fishing boats, to more eccentric floating homes cobbled together from other materials, jerry-rigged as we would say. These boats were described as eyesores, and garbage scows. And in reality, and some of you may have seen them floating in the False Creek of Vancouver, in reality there are more kind of sculptural, floating sculptures or, um, to use another term, architecture without architects. <laughs> Recognizing that this use of the water as a commonwealth was also an inexpensive form of housing and an, alter and an alternative to homelessness, the local newspaper reported that for people who will be rendered homeless by the changes, the city is offering its services of its tenant assistant program. This humanitarian gesture and the cleaning up of a common area that was being used not only as an alternative lifestyle, but also as a means of social reproduction, illustrates the kinds of contradictions that waterfronts are now the nexus of. This contradiction can be grasped more fully in Vancouver um, by the fact that the mayor's um, the mayor of Vancouver's official program to end street homelessness by 2015 through the green, Greenest City Action Plan. So you get a contradiction between the, um, the branding of the city through homelessness and Greenest City Action Plan and this um, taking away of the waterfront as a commons that actually caused homelessness. Such alternative communities as this floating community are tied to 1960s movements of self-sustainability and counter-cultural gestures. And these gestures have become more and more residual on Canada's west coast, once, which was once the liminal strip of alternative cultures. There is a long history of squatting along the waterfront in and around Vancouver, and the oldest existing squat, Finn's Slough, dates back to the 1890s. In Canada, the intertidal zones are a sort of regulatory lost zone with the federal government holding jurisdiction. So the laws are regulated at a distance in some sense. And, and this slight slippage has allowed utopian or countercultural communities to grab onto waterfronts as a form of commons. The Maplewood intertidal squat on the north side of Vancouver's Burrard Inlet, um, sometimes known as the Dollarton squat, was built by artists and other outsiders in the late 1960s, and it's famous literarily for being close to Malcolm Lowry's cabin on, also on that inlet where he wrote Under the Volcano. So there's a, here's a series of images of that squat from the, from the 1960s. Now, as the city um, moved to close down such spaces, um, the squat was burnt by, an, by the RCMP. Uh, there's a Vancouver artist and his son and his, his squat there. There's the uh, friendly RCMP 
greeting people, greeting a community member, there's the outcome of the, of the fire as a way of cleaning up the waterfront. And um, this kind of burning of, of hippie, hippie housing was quite a common um, site in Vancouver, or in BC during the 1960s and 1970s. And um, as, a, as a teenager, when I used to go camping, um, I saw one of these squats burnt as well, quite spectacular and completely illegal by the RCMP. Um, so art historian Scott Watson marks this act of the burning of uh, Dollarton Squat as a turning point or a point of no return in the transformation of metropolitan Vancouver. The Maplewood intertidal squat was constructed not just, alternati not just alternatively to new condominium living, which was developing at the time, but in active polemical opposition to it. Indeed, not only that, but even in opposition to humanist modernism of the 1950s. The hippie aesthetics of the Maplewood squat derived entirely from the crumbling, derived entirely from the crumbling civic inventory. The Maplewood squat was a highly symbolic episode in a dynamic tension between values still active today, Watson says. But ironically, this point of no return has had several historical returns as images of the squats have been used in artworks, and so it exists um, quite strongly in a cultural memory. Most recently, uh, in a project for the Vancouver Art Gallery's off-site um, uh, site, which is close to the gallery but on a major commuter route, Ken Lum built a scale model replica of the squat. This artwork brings a number of contradictions and tensions into play. First, it brings a minor history of the city back into view, and I think kind of hilariously at a reduced scale. Uh, it also pokes at the urban-rural um, or built environment and natural environment divide by bringing this rural housing into the center of the city. But most tellingly, this work um, cannily foregrounds the relationship of public space and the commons um, to the privatization of space through public-private agreements. The Vancouver Art Gallery off-site space is a donated space, donated space on the edge of the Shangri-La, a condominium and hotel building which has, at this moment, apartments ranging from $4.8 million to just below a million dollars for sale. Nothing unusual for the city simply points the, the, the index of the housing market. The irony lies not only in the aesthetics of the scale model wood shacks in contrast to the clean postmodern postmodernism of the Shangri-La, and it lies not only in the appropriation of the utopian impulse of the squat as a Shangri-La, um, as a Shangri-La for those outside of the official economy to a temple for those central to the global economy. That's just a detail of one of the scale models. Um, rather, Lum's work helps us track the relationship of urban transformation and economic shifts as they actively rewrite the possibilities of spatial practices and everyday life. To move to a, a, a different scale, you know, with the shrinking of the commons of the water in Vancouver, I think it can also be countered uh, with a larger utopian gesture, also from the 1960s, that shares the Pacific waterfront. Kenzo Tange's um, blue urbanism plan for the um, Tokyo Harbor. Tange uh, was a member of the short-lived but highly imaginative group of architects and urbanists called the Metabolists, um, and he proposed a utopian project for the city um, over Tokyo Bay. Following futuristic, um, and by that I mean in the past, um, megastructural projects, the Tokyo Bay proposal was to be both a floating and a living city, a metabolist city that could expand and shrink with the population of Tokyo. The plan was a series of floating pods, and it's fantastic how pods are, continue to be our utopian imagination of the future, pods linked through a fixed form that provided housing and infrastructure. Utopian as this sounds, it was grounded architecturally on Courbatier's idea of urban planning based on air, light, and green, and shifted this to air, light, and water to relate to the particular conditions of post-war urban expansion in Japan. Tange's meta megastructure fulfilled Reiner Banham's classical description of the megastructure, not only in its size, as you can see from this image, but in its architectural qualities of having a space frame that allowed plug-in units. So literally, those pods that you see floating there could be added to or taken away as, 
as needed as the, uh, as the um, population of Tokyo expanded or shrunk. However, beyond contract, um, concrete dreams of many megastructures, Tange imagined a Tokyo Bay as an immense tree, holding steady with its trunks and branches, growing and losing leaves, which were these housing pods. Tange's proposal, along with several other floating city proposals for Tokyo, this is another one of them, was devised as an alternative to the Japanese Housing Corporation's solution for the rapid growth of Tokyo. As Raffaella Pernici points out, in April 1958, the, Japanese, the Japan Housing Corporation proposed an extreme solution to the land shortage in the areas of Tokyo metropolis. Their plan was to fill and polder the entire east side of Tokyo Bay, thereby adding 42,000 square kilometers of, uh, of um, new land. It was conceived as the ultimate solution to Tokyo's exceptional urban growth. Tonge's proposal, I think, is compelling uh, today precisely because it's both utopian and pragmatic. Uh, looked at from today's urban planning perspectives, it takes the waterfront as an extension of the city rather than a frontier that demarcates it. Tange's floating city could have been an environmental disaster as well, but I think that it marks an imagination of the waterfront that's missing today, as well as an urban imagination, a space is more and more contested by, spe by speculative finance. I'm kind of setting aside the spectacle of Dubai in this observation because it, you know, the kind of the massive construction of new waterfronts there I think is is utopian in a, in a different way. Uh, utopian in terms of, um, of, of capital as opposed to utopian forms of living. Um, Tange's met metabolist impulse to have his floating extension of the city adhere to Tokyo Bay rather than see it filled in troubles the split of nature and the urban. Metabolist designs still manage to look futuristic today. And I'm sorry, but I, I totally love the metabolists as, as an architectural gesture. And I think they reflected also the emergent environmentalism of the 1960s. This is also a proposed floating city from Buckminster Fuller. Um, so although nature is figured into the imagination of urban waterfront, there are times, eruptions even, when expectations are exceeded. Um, now, at this point, I was going to play a two-minute video of a BC TV report of a gray whale that made its way into Vancouver's, um, into Vancouver's uh, False Creek, but the, the Wi-Fi is not, not strong enough, so I'll have to give an inadequate description of it. So you can imagine the usual talking heads, white folks, man and a woman, very enthusiastically talking about a whale that has made its way from its journey northward into this leisure zone of False Creek of Vancouver, where it's taking a break, where it's enjoying the waterfront, <laughs> where it's having a snack, where it's in Vancouver leading up to the 2012 Olympics, where it's enjoying all of the human possibilities that whales are known to need in their lives and <laughs> social reproduction in order to stop into the glorious globally branded city. And the whale, the whale totally gets you know, appropriated into this discourse of nature and urbanism, gets brought into the branding of the city, and in, in some sense becomes you know, a huge humanist projector in some sense, or has humanism projected onto it. So it's, it's actually quite hilarious, both the enthusiasm of the, uh, of the commentators and the passiveness of the whale and the way that the urban, the way that the urban, uh, urban discourse allows us, where everything is seen as lifestyle. So my next project is um, looking at substantive changes in the whale lifestyle since um, <laughs> neoliberal influences of, of whale, on whales' lives. Uh, so I, there's a way, I think, where nature still astounds the urban, the urban waterfront. So in short, the whale enjoys the waterfront as a lifestyle option reaffirming the lifestyle of the city. So while it may seem absurd to use a kind of disnified whale um, to, as an, as to exemplify shifts in, in urban development, the language of leisure and lifestyle is a relatively new development. Uh, and in this case, the urban design of Vancouver, um, which emerged out of the post-industrial concept of the city. David Lay has described this shift taking place within a wave of national liberalism of the early 1970s that altered urban design in Vancouver. A new, urban ideolo a new ideology of urban development was in the making, Lay writes, 
Urban strategies seem to be passing from an emphasis on growth to a concern with the quality of life. The new liberalism was to be recognized less by its production schedules than by its consumption styles. Again, that tension between labor and leisure, or labor and lifestyle in this sense. This transformation has brought great spatial changes within North American cities, and one unintended effect has been to open a spatial divide in social reproduction. Sites of labor and leisure are often spread apart. Um, and as I've written elsewhere, life becomes um, subordinated to lifestyle. In Vancouver, the shift from an industrially based economy, or even one that, in which there was the making of things, to one largely driven by real estate is based on and driven by an, an effort to raise housing prices to the point where for the middle class and below, or even from the upper middle class and below, the possibility of living where one works is slim. And this is within a culture that stigmatizes non-ownership. As Lay noted, even in 1980, the city was able to make and promote the conditions of the livable city, but they were not able to equitably allocate the ensuing benefits. I'm going to make a shift here to talk about contact zones and new urban frontier and the way that I think there's a new contact zone is formed on the waterfront. So it's narrating the competitive city and the global waterfront. So as most of you are aware, in her influential book, Imperial Eyes, um, Mary Louise Pratt defines contact zone as the space of colonial encounters, the space in which peoples geographically and historically separated come into contact with each other and, establishing, uh, and establish ongoing relations, usually involving conditions of coercion, radical inequality, and intractable conflict. So today, I think the concept of the contact zone is equally useful for the waterfront. For it does draw us back to the history of colonial expansion and contact, a history which still undergirds much of the waterfront in Vancouver, as a high percentage of that waterfront and the high percentage of the coast is unceded First Nations territory, land that is in the contact zone currently of two types of ownership, one based on history and use, even stewardship if we want to take an ec ecological position, and the other on legal structures. Geographer Nicholas Blomley identifies ownership as a spatial enactment and an enactment necessary for settlement. He writes, the enactment of property not only presumes a definitional certainty, this is property, this isn't, but it also invites us to imagine that property and settlement are synonymous. And to challenge ownership at this present moment, I think, as well as to settle ownership, are both ideological acts that produce different types of space public and common, or settled and tied to the entitlements and enclosures of ownership. In this way, the waterfront of B Vancouver has, become, has been an active contact zone in different ways between indigenous knowledges and European settlement since the latter 18th century, certainly intensified at different points. So I want to propose that new global urban waterfront developments have activated a newly scaled set of conditions for a contact zone today. At the urban scale, this contact zone is born out of the contradictions of class as they are refracted through the narrative of deindustrialization, in contrast to the leisure lifestyle, leisure lifestyle driven urban imaginations within the global competitive city scheme. Secondly, the waterfront is also a new nation scale contact zone agitated by security concerns and the amplification of global refugees a contact zone where universal claims for the rights of refugees meet the state-driven laws of citizenship and national discourses of belonging, discourses which have dramatically altered since September 11th, 2001, and obviously, as Janice's presentation showed, have, have changed the nature of borders and belonging. So to make a literary connection here, George Bowring's 1970 serial poem, George, comma, Vancouver, continues the investigation of place that the Tisch poets drew from new American poets such as Olson, Charles Olson, in Bowering's case particularly. But Bowering takes the waterfront as a chronotopic site, a place constructed by the collapsing event of events so that the place is thick with history. This poetic technique represents the waterfront as a continuous contact zone or site of contact, not only between cultures and knowledges, but between versions of historical events. 
It is an innovative yet overlooked postmodern text that confronts history, the very realm that postmodernism was supposed to empty to a gesture of pastiche. George, comma, Vancouver sets the rational knowledge of the of historical Captain Vancouver, who is charting the coast, and his botanist Menzies, who is recording the coast through his drawings, that's set within the fanciful context of a European imagination of the place in, in kind of contrast to indigenous knowledges that view Cook and his crew through a place-based perception. So it's also Bowering's use of irony in this where indigenous knowledges look at Menzies and, and um, Vancouver and cannot figure out what the hell they're doing. As, and likewise for, for Menzies and Vancouver. Um, Vancouver's uh, 1791 to 1795 voyage, which had its first stop in Tenerife, I think briefly for a Canadian literature uh, conference, touched, <laughs> touched just north of San Francisco and was to chart the northern Pacific coast looking for the inland passage, you know, the famed mythical trade route, and to receive such lands or buildings as are to be restored to the British subjects from the Spanish. In Bowering's restaging, time thickens, as does the consequences of contact. It's a small section from the poem. It was agreed by convention between His Majesty and the Catholic King, all buildings and tracts of land on the northwest coast and adjacent lands of which the subjects of His Britannic Majesty were disposed. By April 1789, by a Spaniard to be restored to the British subjects, though nobody moved much. Vancouver's job was to look up to the coast, north to the passage, and check on foreign squatters, especially Spanish. This he did. Some of the islands are called Quadra Texeda Irstazabal. Both, I'm oh, sorry, BC government ferries move between islands with Indian graves, floating milk cartons behind them. So throughout the poem, Bowring collapses time, and here are the effects of the colonial adventures, islands with Indian graves, merge with the BC government ferries, now privatized, and their marine pollution. To make a, a shift to this other type of global border, uh, global urban border, in August 2010, the waters of, that George Vancouver sailed through were navigated by a vessel carrying 492 Tamil refugees from Sri Lanka, from northern Sri Lanka. This was the second boat of Tamil people to arrive in, within a year and the Sun Sea became a national focus of debate, often based on misreadings, willful misreadings of Canadian immigration and refugee laws, as well as an extremely limited knowledge of the Tamil situation in Sri Lanka. The Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and Multiculturalism, Jason Kenney, proclaimed that this unlawful behavior is nothing more than jumping the immigration queue taking up space and resources in our imagination and refugee system that should be focused on those who are legitimate and lawfully waiting their turn to come to Canada. Highly problematic in a number of ways. Um, um, yet as Nava Smolash has pointed out in her research in citizenship and Canadian literature, the minister was ac actually igniting a debate based on the illegal acts of the refugees when, in fact, they had not transgressed any Canadian laws. The media footage of the Tamil people being met um, by uniformed naval and RCMP officers and taken to local prisons where they were held as they were investigated by Canadian border services also built an image of the Tamils as having broken Canadian laws as well as breached its shores. There's uh, the Sun Sea with two naval tugboats, military tugboats. There's those images that circulated. So, so contaminated were the Tamils that, you know, face masks were needed. Of course, we forget that Tamils have, you know, added, Tamil people have added a wonderful texture to Canadian culture since they were welcomed during the race riots in the early 1980s from Sri Lanka. Um, this high profile case shows how the waterfront remains a contact zone, but one that has overlapping politics of scale. As I've suggested, the rights to claim refugee status and to seek political and economic safety, claims that we can scale at the global, clash with national scale discourses of security, citizenship, and national belonging. And these discourses have hardened since September 11th, and we see the waterfront being itself hardened into a border that produces new exclusions. Um, 
Wade Compton's poem, Illegal Lees, Floodgate, Floodgate Dub, that many of you may be familiar with, with, was written previous to this incident, but it makes a link to an earlier and more famous incident in 1914 when the Kamagata Maru was held in the Vancouver Harbor and the 340 Indians, mainly Sikhs, were turned back to India. Compton's poem is itself a linguistic contact zone bouncing discourse off of discourse. Let's give you a brief flavor of what the poem sounds like. If you arrive in the belly of a rusting imagination, there are grounds to outlaw you, but Canada is a remixed B-side chorus in the globalization loop, a sampled track of back-home desiring, old days admiring, democracy dreaming, racism reaping, homesickness that even mediocre, mediocre can't cure. There is no fresh off the boat, or the plane, or the hope of consistency in foreign and foreigner policy, or obdurance of floodgate metaphors, and death sentences deportations. The backbeat backbone of the chorus it screeches back home is the drum and bass treble track alliteration of Kama 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 Gata Maru and the stowaway that the border refused will be the headstone of the corner. When the destination is a nation that prides itself in peacekeeping and, but is still sleeping on the justice and compassion implicit that. But people are not a flood, borders are not God-given, lives are not dollars, Canada is not the sum of its exclusions. So while the examples of the Tamil people and the people on the Kamagata Maru show how racialized people encounter this contact zone of the waterfront, um, I think also that class as a shifting set of social relations and cultural and spatial practices is central, I would argue, to new waterfront developments. So let's make a turn towards um, representations of class on the waterfront, which has a lot of resonances with the paper that Herb started the conference off with. Um, yet, I think that class is a ghosted relationship with the waterfront. Spectral is a discourse, and spectral in the urban imagination for several reasons. Class as a process and a set of social relations is notoriously difficult to represent in our post-Fordist era. Sites of production have been dismantled and dispersed, taking shape in special economic zones, such as in Mexico and Sri Lanka, often behind fences and away from view, reconfigured under flexible conditions of homework. In an essay entitled, Must They Be Represented?, Peter Hitchcock argues that the difficulty of working class representation begins with the fundamental abstractness of class. Class is not a thing, but a relation and one that puts a heavy burden on representation. Nevertheless, he continues, class is an unseen relationship that nevertheless constructs a social reality. In a recent book of poetry, False Works, by Gary Geddes, um, he uses a representational aesthetics that approaches class as a stable category that can be seen. Geddes' documentary poem expands the stories behind the collapse of Vancouver's Second Narrows um, Bridge during its construction in June of 1958. 79 men fell into the ocean and 19 died, um, and today the bridge is renamed the Iron Workers Memorial Second Narrows Crossing. Not such a great name for memorial, but... Now, Geddes retells the um, bridge's collapse and represents the workers by inhabiting their voices, just to give you a sense of it. I don't buy it. Sure, the dead can't defend themselves, but it was there in black and white. A mistake, that's all. False work couldn't take the weight. Forget it, get on with the job, was my view. Not everyone felt the, that way. It's from a poem called Jim. So a lot of the poems are inhabiting the voices of the workers. Now, Getty's poems, poem fits in with a line of Canadian documentary poems, but it also brings images of labor back to the waterfront. The actual materiality of class and indigeneity have both been re removed from many of the stretches of the waterfront that they once occupied. And the working harbor of Vancouver is no longer a public area as it's closed due to new security measures. And I, maybe I'll just add an aside here that one of the projects of the Capilano Band, uh, which is a waterfront band in Vancouver, is to look precisely at the relationship of indigeneity and class, because the, the working harbor was a place where those two knowledges and two, I'll say, spatial practices met. Um, 
The result of um, this, that the working harbor is no longer a public area is that we have a bifurcated harbor. One side fenced off and still industrial, head, hid from view. The other side open and devoted to leisure. Ironically, in many ways, the visibility and class and native presence has now become the representational domain of public art. In his text, The Generic City, um, Dutch architect or starchitect Rem Kohlhaus deplores such stripping away of history in new urban developments. He writes, there's always a quarter called lip service where a minimum of the past is preserved. For Kohlhaus, the generic city celebrates the past as only the recently conceived can. So I think that's one way in which class has been um, you know, abstracted, let's say, from the waterfront. But as I'm suggesting, I think that the waterfront has become a, a contact zone of class and leisure and the contradictions within the competitive city model that geographers have identified. Um, I'll just briefly outline, um, really briefly, what happened with the Vancouver Olympic Village, which was the, um, the Olympic housing that was, that was supposed to have a certain degree of of um, social housing within it, but that was continually lowered and stripped away, and it moved mostly to private, um, moves mostly to private housing. Um, one prominent Vancouver political and urban figure argued that in order for the city to recoup its money and be able to sell the uh, sell the condominiums, which were dramatically not selling because of the um, because of the um, credit crisis and and people holding off to see what was going to happen with the global housing market. Um, he argued that there's four types of people that we had to look at in terms of um, urban texture. A people, B people, C people, and D people. So you get a sense of the subtlety of the analysis. <laughs> um, yeah. And A people were the people who were going to buy the the condominiums, which, which would ironically, you know, bring the city out of its civic debt problem and its and the credit crisis that it found itself put in as the um, developers pulled away uh, from that project and the city took it over. So, in order to attract A people, his proposal was that we had to make sure there is less even B people because A people don't like to mix very much with B people. They'll tolerate them, but they don't like to mix with them. C people who you know, might be renters. A, a people don't like to meet, mix with people who are renters. I'm perhaps you know, sharpening the edges of this debate a little bit, but I have to say in the way that Janice was, was uh, vehement and passionate about, about uh, the Omar Cotter case, I feel very similar to these kind of spatial injustices that happen continually throughout Vancouver. Um, so I think that shows that the waterfront is reimagined as this kind of zone of leisure and a zone for the global elite in some sense. And even the idea of people from the upper middle class who would be able to, you know, in some ways condense their life, life of labor and leisure or the scale of their social reproduction is seen as an impediment to the competitive city model. So in a way, waterfronts have moved from being not only sites of production, but are kind of become disconnected in a new way. You know, that narrative of, of, post -industrial, of a post-industrial city having these dead zones where ironically thousands of people work um, has been, I think, overtaken by this new disconnection where the city, where the waterfront is seen as the economic engine that will be fired, pedal to the metal, by a particular form of global elite um, who have money to park in, in real estate. That's my crude materialist analysis of it. <laughs> um, so to move to uh, a conclusion, I just want to very briefly lay out a notion of a post-political city as a way to engage new and to gauge new waterfront developments. Um, you know, Chantal Mouffe has said that the political always has to do with conflicts and antagonisms and cannot but be beyond liberal rationalism since it indicates the limits of any rational consensus that reveals, that reveals that any consensus is based on acts of exclusion. Um, Jacques Rancière talks about the liquidation of politics, um, which follows the perceived end of the socialist alternative. 
which solidified a consensus on liberal democracy rather than reshaping democracy. Um, he writes, this signified the reduction of democratic life to the management and local consequences of global economic necessity. Now, when this paradoxical return of politics um, that Ranciere argues was its liquidation is scaled to the urban, Aaron's, Eric Svingadau arrives at this notion of the post-political city, a city characterized by consensual arrangements born out of new urban design. Svingadau paints a very stark neoliberal city hollowed out through policies and policing. He says, the polis as a political space is increasingly colonized or sutured by consensual techno-managerial policies. And even just saying that language already makes that happen to me. And also um, intensifying biopolitical control and surveillance. Moving this to new waterfront developments, I would like to raise the question if waterfronts are now imagined and designed as post-political spaces, as they represent a conflict-free and even contradiction-free space. So as I've tried to illustrate, if the waterfront is thought of as a contact zone and, and, and as an urban frontier that is continually pulled through the history of its own making, then it re surely remains and resolutely is a political site. And I would argue that the actual richness of the waterfront is the different textures that its histories, his, histories have produced, textures that seem to be reduced to vestiges or residual traces within new waterfront developments that privilege seamless consumption and leisure. So in Martha Rossler's view, we should read the becoming creative of the post-industrial urban core as a formation of a homogenous space drained of incentives for political engagement. Um, now, in, in terms of art in the political sphere in the post-industrial creative city, Rossler argues that it would seem indisputable that the, public, that the public art or art in public sector in the USA is turned to a service experience model. Um, Margaret Meyer, an urban geographer who, ha, who is more optimistic about the opening of urban spaces to the political, identifies social movements that counter the suturing of urban space, which is the kind of characteristic of the post-political city that Svingadau, um, that Svingadau points to. Um, so I just want to, to close, show a couple aspects or examples of um, art in the public sphere that tried to produce um, spaces of dissensus rather than spaces of consensus. So works of public art or works that challenge the privatization of public sphere, uh, works that challenge the um, post-political aspect of the waterfront. Um, works that create, you know, aim to build spaces of dissensus. Um, for instance, in a project curated by the Swedish group Raket, um, entitled Common Lands on the newly developed harbor in Oslo, the Dutch artist duo Bick van der Poel developed a sound work called Speculation, in tw uh, called Speculation and this was developed in 2010. The work began as a workshop that brought in various social groups as well as people working through the cultural and economic fields. Together, these people developed a script that speculated on the cultural and political future of Oslo and its harbor area. In a resting away, in a resting away of the term speculate from its economic meaning, turning it towards a more utopian impulse and also trying to write a more inclusive social script. Just to give you a sense of some of that language, that was broadcast through the public walkway over the, um, in the Oslo Harbor that was close to the new um, opera. And all of the works that Raquette um, designed for Common Lands um, were all immaterial in a sense. They didn't leave you know, the public sculpture in public space, um, the, what sometimes gets seen as the value-added sculpture. Rather, they were um, discursive and critical projects. So, so some of the language from from the Bick van der Poel project. All speculation is based on the concept of future growth, but future use is not taken into consideration. So thinking in terms of growth is not so progressive. In fact, it is stuck in its own discourse, its own reality, 
The problem with models is that they are reproduced and applied indiscriminately to each city, globally. With the rhetoric of uniqueness, they are selling an image that is different from a neighboring city. And still, to achieve that, they use the same architects everywhere, the same grammar, the same rhetoric of uniqueness. That is one problem. The other problem is the notion of gentrification through the creative class, because, of, because the concept of creative class is itself disgusting, as if this class is more valuable than any other class in the city. We should have asylum seekers. Poor people should have flats in the area. This is reclaimed land where the gypsies, the sailors, the addicts, the whores, the bus, the truck drivers have been. All operate on the outskirts of society. The opera is taking back this area and giving it to the bourgeoisie. So you get a sense of the, the kind of different public language, the language of dissensus that was broadcast into that harbor. And I recognize that this is a a long lecture and, uh, and the room is hot, so I want to um, close by looking at um, a video, it's a five minute video, we can just have it run in the background, of um, Vancouver artist Kathy Slade. And it's a video that I, I like quite a lot because I think it actually playfully troubles that divide between labor and leisure that is a hallmark of the new competitive waterfront. Oops. So this was shot in 16 millimeter um, film, hence it's, it, it's kind of formal constraint that it was the length of one reel of, one reel of um, the film. Now there's sound with this, but it's not totally necessary. That's Vancouver's inner harbor. So essentially what you have is the tugboat at play in the you know, post-industrial zone, supposed post-industrial zone of the, of the port, which is also the area of the port that's closed off because of security measures. So I just like the way that this video troubles that separation of, of labor and leisure, troubles the notion of uh, narrative of post-industrialism. And, uh, and in some ways, I think, you know, challenges some of our representations of class as, as a process. And in making the, the video, uh, Kathy was telling me that she also had to explain her project in detail to the tugboat master, because the idea of renting a, a tugboat for unproductive work over, <laughs> over an hour was somewhat difficult to explain. Yet even though the work was unproductive, um, she didn't get a discount, and it was still quite, <laughs> quite expensive to, to rent this. But, so um, I'll just keep this running in the background, but thanks very much for your patience and indulgence. <laughs> Significant damage to the city, erosion of local diversity, commodification of place identity, the erosion of public space through privatization, and its tranquilization through new forms of exclusion and purification. So to expand on the story of waterfronts and their globalized and localized roles, I want to turn to literary and artistic engagements with these sites. And I'll attempt to do this within a framework that catches the shifts in cities that have brought us to this moment.
cities today are tied into an economic system that often pits place against place in, com in competition for elusive global capital. Urban geographers call this phenomena the competitive city model, and it's laced into neoliberal forms of urban governance and two shifts, I think, in the global economy which have turned attention to cities in new ways. The first shift, identified by Neil Smith as an economic development in which, quote, most crucially, real estate development becomes the centerpiece of a city's productive economy, an end to itself, justified by appeals to jobs, taxes, and tourism. In ways that could hardly have been envisioned in the 1960s, when gentrification emerged as a process, the, con the construction of new gentrification complexes in central cities across the world has become an increasingly unsaleable capital accumulation strategy for competing urban um, Thanks, bill -Ann for that generous introduction, and um, I'm really proud to be part of the global cultures. I'm really part, uh, proud to be part of the global cultures project as well. And, um, and it's really great to be gathered here with all of um, my colleagues from Canada and beyond um, <laughs> in Vigo, which has become an important global site for the rearticulation of, of Canadian literature, I think. It's become a, a node in the uh, circulation of knowledge and the transformation of knowledge um, in Canada, as both Canada and Spain go through dramatic transformations as they enter into an imagined competitive global economy, the way that these things are being refigured. So what I'd like to do is um, do a kind of lateral lecture on changes on the waterfront, the way that the waterfront has been reimagined in some senses since the 1960s, as you see in this image, um, to today. And so I, I want to do this by looking at some literary representations and, and, um, and projects from visual arts. So to give a little bit more of a cultural engagement with the kind of economic discourses that we've been asked to live our lives through. Um, my title is simply On and Off the Waterfront, which refers to the movie, but also to the Miles Davis album On, on and Off the Corner. Uh, in a recent text on urbanism and art, the American artist Martha Rosler, so to expand on this story and to give it a cultural view, I want to move through the idea of the waterfront and the shore as a contact zone in a colonial and cultural manner and move through the debate to the political, which has recently sprung from the work of Carl Schmitt and the way that Chantal Mouffe has re rejigged that, amongst others, to question whether urban waterfronts are now imagined as an important aspect of the post-political city. Rather than being a contact zone where cultural and political conflicts intersect, or as a dangerous and alluring liminal space that formed a seam in the city, as Rossler describes, and an urban frontier, waterfronts are now designed as conflict-free zones, or imagined as conflict-free zones, that are understood to be the outcome of shifts in the global economy and the desires of urban dwellers. So that relationship between consumption side and production side um, alterations within the city. My shift to passive language here mirrors the passiveness of much of the language of recent urban developments. Consider, for example, the lack of historical actors in this description from an important anthology on waterfronts and post-industrial cities. Um, so just to give you a sense of the language, waterfronts speak to a past based in industrial production. So please don't look out the window and see any industrial production because otherwise it throws this narrative off. Um, economies. So even through the kind of denseness of that language, you get a sense of the, the, um, the way that the economic has, has altered the texture of cities and everyday life. So as a result, gentrification is now, a, is now common globally, taking particular shapes, of course, and textures in cities, and shifting from a neighborhood effect to larger scale transformation. Secondly, leading up to the economic crisis extended from over 2007 and 2008 and continuing today to a lesser degree, David Harvey argues that um, a cyclical accumulation crisis led to real estate to become a fixed site for the parking of, of global capital, for, for the accumulation crisis of excess capital. This abstract process alters cities in many material ways, 
So in my experience living in Vancouver on the edge of Stanley Park, I look out from the window of our rented one bedroom apartment to a 24 story building that has three apartments in use, while the others essentially function as long term speculative yet reasonably safe banks, or as Peter Yeager and I were joking about it, it's more like they're electronic deposit zones in some sense. Um, I'm sure in Spain there's similar examples, particularly in globalized cities where, where um, this elusive capital is, is parking itself. Comments that recent large-scale developments mark a further step in the long transformation of urban waterfronts. Formerly the filthy and perilous haunts of the poor, often transient and foreign-born workers servicing the ports into recreational zones, beckoning the most, mostly young and decidedly upper middle class. The water's edge, which was once figured as the dangerous divide between this world and underworld, between safety and the unknown, now promises pleasurable adventures in travel and beach going. So Rosler's dramatic narrative of the class makeover of waterfronts only tells part of the story of the transformation of cities in the last 35 years or so. Yet it does point to the ways that the waterfront has moved from, a lo from localized sites of production and global transportation to new zones of leisure and consumption within an urban fabric textured more and more by the rights of ownership and the dreams of the engine of real estate than by notions of civic democracy or even dreams of urban diversity. As Kim Dovey points out in a study of Melbourne, waterfront transformations offer possibilities for urban innovation, new visions of the city in the form of urban design, public art, and architecture that reconstructs the cognitive map of the city. However, there is simultaneously the potential for significant